The youngest and most ambitious among the general officers were naturally the most discontented. Stopped all of a sudden in the midst of their career, forced to mix again with the crowd. Fortune and honors escaped from their hands when they seemed to have only one step more to take to gain them. Accustomed to a showy life, their large salaries were suddenly cut off. And they experienced great disappointment in not being able to keep up the brilliant rank that had been assigned to them in the army and in the world. The enjoyment of which would perhaps have comforted them. I do not say that their love of their country and their devotion to the emperor had not a great share in their resentment. And all those causes added together made their situation insufferable. The universal contempt for the new government and the clamor that was raised on all sides persuaded them that the favorable moment for an insurrection had arrived. And some of them did not hesitate to employ for that end the troops with which government had entrusted them for its defense in full reliance on the oath of allegiance they had taken. I had not the least knowledge of the plot. It was Monsieur de P who first spoke to me about it, and who, with the confidence and levity of youth, acquainted me with all its particulars. He did not even seek to hide the names of any of its leaders. By all I had heard, I soon discovered that everybody knew the secret except government. It was Marshal Sewell, who held the portfolio of the War Department, but having at that time no other wish than to efface by his new zeal, the remembrance of his old affection for the Republic and the Emperor, he consecrated all his time to the Vendeans and their history, making the king sign an ordinance for the monument at Quiberon and placing them in the army. Far from enlightening the sovereign on the spirit of the army and the people, he knew so little about it himself that he thought it quite natural to assemble with great eclat in the city of Nantes, all the remains of the old rebels of the Vendée for a solemn distribution of pensions and orders. The Nantes, at the sight of their old foes, who had so frequently shown marks of cruelty, were at the point of insurrection. The agent of the minister was obliged to run away, leaving behind him an incensed population, ready to take up arms to repel this counter-revolutionary attempt. This awkward act was soon after followed by an unjust and brutal measure, which augmented the exasperation of the military. General Exelsmond, one of the most brilliant leaders of the army, had been first aide-de-camp to the king of Naples, Murat, one of the physicians of that prince, setting off to join him, Exelsmond, gave him a letter wherein he feelingly expressed his attachment to his former general. Some loose words on the energy of the army, which still subsisted notwithstanding the peace and offers of service, concluded his letter. The person who had taken charge of it was arrested. The letter was then delivered to the Minister of War, then General Dupont, who reprimanded General Exelsman for the very slight impropriety he had committed. But the letter remained in the office of the minister. One of the first measures of Marshal Sewell, when he took the portfolio, was to decide that General Exelsman should leave Paris and go and reside until further orders in the department where he was born. The general resisted, alleging with reason that his natural home was in the metropolis, having no property in the department where he had not even been for the last... 20 years. Finally, he only solicited a respite. Madame Axelsmann had been for three days in the pains of childbirth. All the friends of her husband surrounded him and encouraged him to resist an order which had all the appearance of a lettre de cachet. The minister was going to use violence when one of the general's companions in arms General Flat O helped him to escape. A court martial assembled at Lille to try him. He went there and was acquitted. This acquittal was a fresh triumph to the friends of the emperor and a powerful encouragement to those who were at the head of the plot. One of the leaders was General Lalma, whom I had known in Italy and in Egypt when he was an officer of the guards and afterwards aide-de-camp of General Junot. 
He wished me to take an active part in the conspiracy and especially to undertake the commission of acquainting the emperor with it. He observed that I had undoubtedly kept secure means of corresponding with him. He opened to me his plans, which were to seize the persons of the Bourbon, proclaiming the emperor and replace him on the throne, Marshal Davu, the dukes of Otranto, Fouché, and Bassano, and several others whose name I forget, were the heads of the enterprise. The more he advanced in his explanation, the more my alarm and uneasiness deprived me of all power of replying. In listening to him, it was not, I acknowledge, the fate of the king that caused my anxiety, but that of the emperor. I, however, answered, the persons whom you have named are very able and their cooperation undoubtedly makes your success very probable. But still, it seems to me you dispose very freely of the emperor simply to acquaint him with an undertaking in regard to which he has not been previously consulted. To dispose of his fate without his permission appears to me to be a very bold act. First, I positively declare I have no sure means of sending him a letter. I even entreat his friends not to address him any, as I am sure they will be stopped by the posts of France and Italy and sent to Vienna, where Monsieur de Talleyrand strongly solicits a more distant exile for the emperor. The motives on which he grounds his demand have not as yet appeared sufficient to determine the allied powers to such a measure. But I leave you to judge what effect would be produced upon them by a correspondence such as you wish to undertake. I am convinced the emperor would be set to the world's end and perhaps even murdered. Who knows whether he may not have plans of his own which yours may counteract and destroy. Do you think his mind is weakness? Weakened? Has he no friends left in Italy? Can he not easily be informed of what happens here? Finally, has he left his orders with anybody? Has he sent any over since he has been in the island of Elba? As you think it dangerous to write, replied the general, we shall strive to send somebody of great trust. As for our plan, it is too far advanced for us to delay the execution of it any longer. If we put it off till some other time, the emperor will be one day unexpectedly removed from the island of Elba in spite of the brave men who guard him, and then all will be lost beyond resource. For the rest, speak to the Duke de Bassano, communicate to him your anxiety, but be sure we will not. This government is not to be born. We will break it with our swords. Our resolution is taken. I went the day after to the Duke de Bassano, whom I had not seen since the restoration. After having related the conversation I had had with Lalimont, I expressed my fears not only in regard to a correspondence with the island of Elba, but also to the strange trust they reposed in the Duke of Otranto, Fouché. Murat spoke openly to me. This is quite a military operation, he said. We have nothing to say in it. All that concerns us is the return of the emperor. I know not how to acquaint him of it. If you have no means, and if you think them all dangerous, I am moreover as much convinced as you are that it would be his certain ruin to commit even a single word to paper. And in fact, I gave no letter to Monsieur Fleury de Chaboulon, who you know set off more than a fortnight ago. To be sure, when he left us, the military conspiracy was not yet hatched, or at least I had no knowledge of it. As to the Duke of Otranto, Fouché, I do not share your mistrust. He has entered on the business with so much ardor, and he is on such bad terms with the Bourbons that I am sure he will not betray us. Very well. But suppose he be sincere in this, and who knows whether he has not some afterthought and whether he does not intend to work for another. I do not know for whom it should be. He can have no thoughts on the Duke of Orléans. Of that, I have indisputable proofs. Neither he nor any other would dare to touch that question with the prince. Come and see me often, and I shall make you acquainted with everything. 
my conversation with the Duc de Bassano had augmented my fears for the emperor. The name of the Duke of Otranto, Fouché, appeared fatal to me. And I returned a few days afterwards to the Duke's house to speak again with him on the subject. He was closeted with the Prince of Ecmul Davu, but I found Count Thibaudo, who was very well informed of the whole business and knew the plot in its most minute particulars. I communicated to him my anxiety concerning Fouché. His answer was, it is not yet very clear in my eyes that he really wishes for the return of the emperor, but he will remain faithful to us on the occasion. While we were talking together, the Prince of Ecmul Davu came out of the Duke's cabinet and the latter taking us aside acquainted us that the prince had just declared he gave up all cooperation in the undertaking. The reason he gave was the levity of the leaders and the certainty that the court had already some suspicion on the subject. His resolution came rather late. His name had encouraged all the others. The means of execution had been submitted to him and he had approved of them. It was therefore fear that made him recede, for repentance could scarcely find a place in the heart of such a man. Finally, he stopped rather late, the motion having already begun, the dike being broken, and the torrent ready to overflow on all sides. The initiated were expecting with great anxiety the news of the rising. Only three days more were wanted for us to receive it, when we learned that Lalimon and Lefebvre de Nuet had been discovered at La Ferrand through the vigilance of General Daboville and Colonel Lyon that Lalumont was taken with his brother and that a court martial was already convoked to try them. The cause seemed lost beyond resource. Anxiety and despair seized all the friends of the emperor without uneasiness. With regard to myself, I sighed over the fate of so many brave men who were going to expiate on the scaffold their fidelity for whom they still looked upon as their sovereign when suddenly an extraordinary event, an absolute miracle, began to be reported about secretly at first, but soon with undoubted certainty. It was on Monday, the 7th of March. I was crossing the Tuileries at 9 o'clock in the morning when I perceived on the steps of the gate leading to the Rue de Rivoli, Monsieur Paul Lagarde, late commissary general of the police in Italy. I saluted him with my hand in passing by and continued my way under the trees toward the terrace on the water side. Hearing some person near me, I was going to turn round when the following words were whispered in my ear. Make no gestures, show no surprise, do not stop. The emperor landed at Cannes on the 1st of March. The Count d'Artois set off last night to oppose him. It would be impossible for me to express the confusion into which these words threw me. I could scarcely breathe from emotion. I continued walking like an inebriated man and repeating to myself, is it possible? Is it not a dream? or the most cruel mockery. When I arrived on the terrace on the water side, I met the Duke de Vincenza Calancourt, went up to him, and I repeated to him the news word for word, and in the same tone of voice in which I had received it, he being of a hasty temper and accustomed to view things on the worst side, exclaimed, what an extravagance, how? To land without troops? He will be taken. He will not advance two leagues into France. He is a lost man, but it is impossible, however. He added, it is but too true that the Count d'Artois set off hastily last night. The ill humor of the Duke de Vincenza, Calancourt, and his fatal forebodings were irksome to me. I left him to indulge at liberty the joy I experienced. At home, I found no one who would share it. Madame Lavalette was dismayed at the news and drew sad omens from it. I ran to the Duchesse of St. Lou, Hortense, and found her bathed in tears of joy and emotion. After a lapse of a few moments, we began to calculate the immense distance between Cannes and Paris. What will the generals do that command on that road? What the public authorities, what the troops, what effect will the arrival of the Count d'Artois produce? It appeared to us as if nothing could resist the emperor, and we concluded that when once he should arrive at Lyon, all opposition would become impossible. From that moment, the duchess closed her door, all the suspicions of the royalists, 
All the eyes of the police centered upon her. During the 11 months it had elapsed, her house had not been much frequented. Some generals, a few ladies, and young men of the new court visited her often, but the conversation never turned upon the emperor. A small number of faithful friends alone now and then inquired what was his manner of living, what would be his future situation. An undefined feeling convinced us that he would return that a life of miracles would not be terminated on a rock between Italy and France. But how and by what means that was to happen, our imagination, active as it was, could not conceive. Every day we counted the errors government committed, those they were supposed to commit, and the mass of prepossessions, complaints, violent or satirical writings in which the ridicule of the royalists and the absurdity of their plans were exposed to light with so much bitter irony. But notwithstanding all that, the people were satisfied with laughing and shrugging their shoulders. The soldiers obeyed and the mob appeared to remain quiet. How could the emperor therefore think of showing himself to a government that appeared strong and to a people that seemed to have forgotten him? And lo, all of a sudden he lands in France, he agitates the minds of everyone, his formidable name spreads dismay and discouragement among those who command and those who detest him. The days, hours, and minutes were counted. Every morning, the newspapers published the most sinister reports. He'd either been taken or had fled to the mountains. No certain accounts were received. Our consternation augmented from day to day. I took long walks in the suburbs and found everywhere the appearance of complete indifference. The labors and habits of the people remained the same, but the police who carefully gathered the movements of the evening in the cabarets and other places of resort of the lower classes were struck with awe at the energetic speeches and terrible plans that were secretly circulated. They dare not, however, imprison any individual of those classes for fear of causing riots, the consequence of which might have been frightful. It must, however, be acknowledged that the tradespeople, moneyed men, and lawyers did not share these sentiments. The position of the court inspired no interest. The jests to which it was exposed gained rapid applause, but still, the too recent presence of the enemy caused great anxiety and a sort of stupefaction at the arrival of the emperor. Nevertheless, with the exception of a few young men who enlisted at Vincennes as royalists, nobody appeared willing to fight. The Count d'Artois returned in despair, unable to place any confidence in the army. All the regiments he had met with, all the troops he had assembled at Lyon, had refused to obey his orders. Marshal MacDonald, so beloved by the army, could not even obtain a hearing. The great name of Napoleon had intoxicated and turned the minds of everyone. An immense number of peasants had joined the army. A word, a sign, would have been sufficient to make them murder all the nobles and priests. Fortunately, some moderate men undertook to lead the insurrection and found means to direct it solely towards Bonaparte. Do not tarnish the emperor's name. They cried on all sides. He will not suffer a drop of blood to be spilt. Days passed away, and each hour made the danger more imminent. Monsieur D, the prefect of police, was succeeded by Monsieur Brienne. The friends of the emperor knew what they had to fear from that man, who was a former schoolfellow of Napoleon at the military college and afterwards his secretary. He had been dismissed for some shabby tricks, and at the restoration he had delivered himself up body and soul to the royalist party. The choice of this person had been undoubtedly fixed upon because he was perfectly well acquainted with all the friends of the emperor and their habits. I knew that he was capable of any act, and I was particularly anxious about the Duchess of St. Louis, Hortense, and her two children, whom it was resolved to take as hostages in case the court should be obliged to fly to foreign parts. She went, however, betimes to seek a refuge with an old Creole woman from Martinique who was entirely devoted to her, not wishing to compromise any of my friends. I concealed myself in the Hotel of the Duchess, but in that part of the house kept apart for the servants. It was 
the 14th of March. I had no news from the provinces, but notwithstanding the false accounts with which the papers were filled, I could see that the emperor advanced rapidly, and it was no longer possible to oppose any obstacle to his march. The Duke de Berry had just received the command of a camp near Paris. The officers who had begun by immeasurable professions of fidelity soon grew colder and more reserved. As for the soldiers, the wind itself seemed to waft to them the name of the emperor. Every bird they saw was to them the imperial eagle. The rigor of military discipline, exhortations, and treaties were not capable of keeping them within bounds. And during the three last days that preceded the arrival of the emperor, woe to those among the troops who would have dared to abuse him or designed to attack him.